Hello, I'm Bradley Alisea. And today I'm going to talk to you about Community Tools 1. Uh, this is a, sort of an overview of different community tools and things that might be useful for building a community and things that you might want to adopt. So let me share my screen and I'll begin. And so I've done this in collaboration with the Orthogonal Research and Education Laboratory and one of the, my lab manager there, Jesse Parent. And so he's going, and I'm going to borrow from some of his videos that he's made on some of these tools. He's very good at like organizing these tools and bringing them to our attention. So this should be uh, kind of an interesting uh, foray into this area. So what are collaboration tools? Um, so collaboration tools allow people to have better ways of organizing their individual work, seamlessly working between contributors, and finding ways to easily onboard new contributors into an existing workflow. So basically you wanna have something that someone coming into the community can easily adopt, easily use, but also things that allow for people to do their own work on their own, and then transfer that directly and convert that into something that they can collaborate with others. So, you know, you, and sometimes you might be working outside the organization, sometimes you might be working inside the organization. So as you know from Google uh, Docs, Sometimes the permissions, you know, they're not, they're imperfect. They don't always allow you to share easily. And so these are things we want to avoid or think about. And these tools may help with that. They may also not be very useful, but these are things that I think they have a lot of the features that we want. So the first tool is Notion. And this is notion.so if you want to look this up on the web. It's hard to really characterize what Notion is, but basically it's a good tool for building checklists, tables, and outlines for organizing resources and media assets. Basically building things that organize your content or organize your activities. Notion pages can be used to create web documents as well, or sometimes shared amongst collaborators. So, you know, sharing a Notion document is pretty easy and straightforward. So this is an example of my Notion you have this menu on the left where there's some documents here, some getting started documents and useful links. And then you create your own documents and they're listed in this, in this outline form. So you have documents that have uh, sub documents and so forth, you can organize in that way. And if you look at this document that I'm showing you now, procedures and follow-ups, uh, it you know, consists of a number of different data structures that we might create to organize data. So you have, for example, these checkboxes and these uh, nested lists. So you have onboarding procedure, and I've listed the onboarding procedure for the community, and it's organized as a checklist so that when I, uh, you know, I can follow through in order, make sure that that order makes sense. I can move them around by grabbing the object and moving it up or down. I can check them off if I'm done or cross them out with a strike through if I'm done. And then I can re reorganize this. I, I revisit this notion every so often to modify and update and add on to. So, you know, you have checklists, you can also build tables, you can build, uh, you can put in uh, uh, images, you can do other sorts of things, you can build headings and subheadings and other types of structures. And it's just all with different characters that you use on your keyboard. So you'd use backslashes for certain things and other, you know, other symbols. It doesn't take very much to build. Uh, you know, they provide little templates of, of uh, data structures that you can use to build. And so this is a nice way of organizing resources, organizing lists, but you can also build more complex documents. And this is Jesse's website. And I believe this was built in Notion even though it's hosted on GitHub. Um, it's a nice document where you have, you can actually define HTML elements, you can define the text, you can define how it's organized, and that's all possible in Notion. So Notion is actually a pretty flexible tool. You have your own account, your collaborators have their own account, you can share documents with them with these, and they can share documents with you. There's an educational version of Notion as well that's actually quite functional. I use the educational version. I also have a personal version. And, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a cost to the sort of the deluxe version, but you can use this for free pretty easily. The next tool I'm going to talk about is called Obsidian. 
And Obsidian is interesting. It's it's not really like Notion. It's like Notion in the sense that it handles notes and note taking, which is actually, uh, I think, an underappreciated um, thing to have. Because good, you know, good note taking skills are very good for organizing thoughts, but organizing those notes is actually very good. And so, whereas Notion organizes notes like kind of personal notes and even organized documents. Obsidian actually organizes different resources that you might download. So you might have like a collection of notes or a collection of PDFs and you can organize them into this uh, project. And so it's hard to see here. I might zoom in a little bit more, but um, this is uh, what they call a vault. And you can put papers or documents in the vault and then you can draw from that vault and, and display things. And so um, I have a student that works with the Orthogonal Research Lab, Amanda Nelson, and she actually used this in a lab meeting once. She did a presentation on this topic of the concepts of digital and analog. And she used this uh, Obsidian tool to organize her thoughts to do the whole presentation. It was about 30 minutes long. And if you click on this video clip link, you'll go to the meeting, the point where she starts her presentation. She's on for about 30 minutes. And you know you can do a presentation right from this set of notes. You bring up papers, you can display things here on the left. You see that there are notes that she's taken on things, they come up. So it's all, you know, it's not like a PowerPoint presentation, but it allows you to communicate effectively to people about, you know, maybe a topic that you're exploring. And you need, you don't, you don't really want to create slides, but you want to give people a general idea of what's there. And so you know, these, these vaults allow you to or store and organize notes around themes. And so that's where the value of that comes in. So that's Obsidian, obsidian.md. And this is available, Obsidian is available for mobile on, in, in mobile version and in desktop version. So you can use it uh, pretty much on the go or on your uh, desktop. Uh, the next topic, next uh, resource I'll, I'll talk about is ZenHub. So that's zenhub.com. Zenhub is a little bit different than the other two. Um, it's a tool that allows you to organize milestones, something in time from a set of GitHub issues. But as you'll see, GitHub issues are actually parallel to something else that Zenhub uses. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So Zenhub provides sort of, uh, it provides a nice seamless plugin to GitHub, but it also has its own set of conventions built on top of that that allow you to visualize things. So ZenHub allows a timeline view, which is this figure here, and a Kanban board view, which of course I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and this can be helpful for seeing the big picture on projects. So you have this, this is your timeline that ZenHub generates. These are a series of GitHub issues that we have. And in, Git, in GitHub, you have a Kanban board and you have your issues as little boxes and they exist in different categories. So there is a temporal aspect to GitHub's Kanban board. You start, you have something maybe like a to-do list, you have starting issues, you have in progress, you have maybe hold, urgent, completed. So it's like you go through this workflow. Um, that they may or may not be useful depending on what you wanna do. You may have multiple milestones that you have to complete and those, you could set up columns for those, but those become unwieldy and it's a discrete system. This is more of a continuous system. It matches up with time. And you know you can set milestones in ZenHub and you can create what they call epics and you have this temporal accountability. So here's today, and this is when this video was created. I took a screenshot from Jesse's video. Uh, you can see what has happened in the past, the milestones that you've completed, the things that are sort of out of date, but you can also see the things that you're doing today and the things that you might be doing tomorrow. So it's all visible in this one visualization. And this, uh, these, so these are projects and epics. These are the uh, timelines for each. This is the line for today, and this is your calendar. So you can see that there are a couple of things that we want to hit today. We go into a meeting and we get this thing and we'll say, okay, here are the things we're doing today. Here are the things we've done in the recent past. Here are the things we have to go in, in the near future. And so it gives you that temporal view. 
This is a, a, a Kanban board in Zen Hub. So this is a little bit different than uh, GitHub, but again, you have these columns and you have these different categories. So you have, and it's hard to see this, but you have new issues in this column. You have icebox, which is, I guess, a hold column where you, you know, you freeze things in time. You have product backlog, which means that you, you know, these things need to be completed. You have a sprint backlog, which is, of course, using the agile process of sprints and, and other things. So this is where you have a backlog of or, uh, things that need to be sort of approached through a sprint. Uh, these are what we call active epics, and this is in progress. So act, in epics, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's the sort of the organizing principle of this board. So it's not like the timeline. It, it's more of sort of like a categorical organization, but also in, in time from starting to completion. So you can see it's very much like GitHub, except that, as we'll see, there's some uh, critical differences in how they organize this. So organizing tasks using a timeline view allows us to track milestones. So again, we can track milestones. You saw in those little, in those boxes over time that you had little uh, uh, clicks in there that represented milestones. So you can visualize the milestones. You can see how far you've gone, which milestones you've completed and so forth. Every task in GitHub allows you to build milestones into them, but doesn't necessarily allow you to visualize them. And that's what, um, that's what ZenHub does really well. So this is essential for complex tasks like public events. So if I'm hosting a public event, I wanna be able to have a series of tasks, series of sets, you know, uh, degrees of completion, but then I also want to know kind of like if I'm inviting speakers, you know, when do I need to have the invites out by? When do I need to hear back from people by? And so on and so forth. And that will allow me to track internally to that task. So uh, again, as the Zen Hub, de Zen Hub demo shows, milestones are specific points on a project timeline. They may act as anchors or as concrete goals with an associated date. So one of the things about Zen Hub is you can move those uh, anchors out. You can stretch out the length of your, uh, of your timeline for your task. So you, know, you can do this in, in GitHub too, but it's a little harder because you have to do it manually. But you can do this like visually in Zen Hub. And so it makes things flexible. These prospective milestones can be flexible depending on how much is achieved. So you have this sort of dependency that you use. So, you know, if we're in the first stage of our issue, we have to account for how much time it's gonna take. We, we kind of estimate how much time it's gonna take. And then if we need more time, we can just simply pull everything out and it updates everything going down the line. So that's a good, uh, you know, it, it kind of gives you that total control of just going through uh, you don't have to go through every milestone one by one. You can change the whole thing on the fly. Providing a concrete goal is good motivation for focusing efforts, particularly when open source contributions are involved. So in general, milestones are very good for focusing contributions or focusing like, you know, getting things done. But oftentimes you do want to change those and you want to adapt. And as a, as a management tool, for managing contributions, you know, you don't want to delay things indefinitely, but you do want to give people flexibility to push things back if they need to. And then finding the balance between pushing things around and getting things done on a, you know, tighter deadline, just even if it's just to focus the mind, is, is something that really uh, collaboration tools don't really help you with. But you can use those to sort of help you think through that process and when it's appropriate, when it's not. So a good tip for timeline building is to have parallel activities going on. So if you're building a timeline and you want to build multiple issues with multiple milestones, and you want to have someone complete the set of issues and set of milestones in a certain amount of time, a good way to approach this is to have multiple things going on. So you know you have like say like three things going on at one time. And you focus on one, and then you focus on the next one, you focus on the next one. But having this kind of timeline view allows you to think about if, what, if one of your issues, if one of your milestones gets delayed for whatever reason, there's something else I could be doing right now that will fill the gap. 
So in other words, I prioritize my three issues by like urgency. And I try to attack the most urgent one first. The problem is, is that I get, I get hung up on the most urgent one, some technical issue. And so if I get hung up on that, what can I do to overcome that time delay? Because then if you have a time delay and you do nothing, it pushes everything back and you lose focus and you, you, know, you may not be able to contribute at all. So being able to go to another issue, the second priority issue, figure out what milestone you can tackle there and then move back to that first high priority issue and complete that when the time is right. That helps you manage your time a lot better. So this is something that I brought up because I, I wanted to bring this into focus is why you might want to have all these different uh, things tracked by time and organized by time and, and milestone. And so if you're interested in agile management and the rise of software development in general, there's this nice article on Logic Mag, and it kind of talks about the origins of agile. And I'm not really trying to sell you an agile, but I want you to be aware of it because a lot of the concepts we talk about come from that area. And so it's interesting about this article, it lays out kind of the history of how agile come to, uh, came to predominate software development. Software development used to be very disorganized in a lot of ways. And so there was no really no management process whatsoever. And as you can imagine, that could be very chaotic. So especially in open source communities, it's nice to have this agile framework in place um, or to at least draw from. And these tools are actually help you fit into that sort of framework. So if you're doing a sprint, for example, um, you know, some of these tools like Notion um, might be useful or Obsidian might be useful for organizing notes or organizing thoughts and getting them out quickly and communicating quickly. Um, you know, if you're doing asynchronous work, but you want to complete a task on time, you know, it may be that you have to do things like, you know, prepare a set of notes and make them intelligible to a uh, collaborator halfway around the world. And that's something that you can do maybe in Obsidian or in um, Notion or even in your Zen Hub uh, visualizations. Uh, then we're gonna talk about epics. And so epics are the thing that I was sort of alluding to before. And this is something unique to Zen Hub. And it's, it's kind of like GitHub issues, but they're not. Um, so Zen Hub uses this type of organization called epics. And epics encapsulate a theme of work. So it's like a theme of work. It's not really an issue, but it's a theme of work. And you saw on the board there that you had uh, epics. So you had active epics and you had these areas of work here. And they look like issues, but they're actually not because they give you this, uh, it's like sort of like a theme of work. I guess it's a way of organizing your issues into these different things. So it allows you to kind of organize around themes. So if I have similar issues, I may be able to organize them into an epic and then put a timeline on that. And so um, epics are similar to GitHub issues in that they are both organized by subject. So GitHub issues can be organized by subject. Epics are maybe another level up where it, you know, it's that type of issue. Um, however, epics introduce dependencies to your GitHub issues, and they can be used in tandem. So you can use these two in tandem. Um, this is different from a sprint, okay, where things are related by time. So in sprints, you'll want to take, and I told, I told you Zen Health is about time, but it's actually not always about time. Um, sprints are these things that you do in maybe like a two-week period or a weekend. And you take your GitHub issues and you try to, you know, address as many of them as possible. You try to organize them a little bit and you, you try to knock them off, get them out of the way. And it's just a way to focus your efforts on one sm small period of time where you have time to do this. And then you go back and evaluate the results of it. In epics, it's not like that necessarily. In epics, it's about organizing things by theme. Then you can put them on a timeline and you can address them during the sprint. Um, in sprints, of course, tax, tasks are accomplished as a, in an accelerated workflow. So we have this timeline, we have this normal time, and then during a sprint, we might accelerate the timeline and shrink down 
our little block of time that this uh, issue is devoted to or this epic. And so epics are just ways of organizing these issues by topic. So if we go back to the timeline, we have, um, I think this is like AI ethics framework. And this was a, a presentation at a conference, this blue line here. And so there are a bunch of uh, GitHub issues associated with that. And this, this epic lasts maybe a month and a half. And so, you know, you're gonna in that month and a half, that's normal time. During a sprint, you might be able to take this down to like a week where you address all these issues. The idea here in this, in this type of application of it is that we start with like say a, a, an abstract submission and we follow through to where things need to be submitted like a presentation needs to be submitted and, and presented. So all these, there are all these tasks within this epic. And during a sprint, we could shrink that down. We could shrink a lot of the work down. I mean, there'd still be like we'd be presenting here, but a lot of the work would be done in this period. Or, you know, conversely, we just keep, you know, we may have an extension, we may go further out. But this is a way to organize all these tasks associated with this epic in time. Um, so this is not a, this. Epics are actually not, they're related to um, sprints, but they're not sprints. Um, now, using sprints, GitHub issues, and Zen Hub epics, like I just showed you in that example, if you were, use those all together in the right way, they can be very powerful. And they, they serve as a nice way to synchronize community contributions and reduce conflicts with a top-down software development cycle. So this is thing more broadly to open source development and how you know you may have like a roadmap that you're completing and you're contributing to that roadmap. You don't want to override parts of the roadmap. You don't want to fall behind the roadmap. You want to keep pace with it. But because you're an open source contributor, you have, you know, you have a different schedule than maybe like the main development team, or you may have uh, things that need to be done that are outside of that roadmap, but also contributing to that roadmap. So there are things that you need to do to help you sort of synchronize. With them. And these tools, if you use them in the right way, can really help you do that, achieve that. Uh, and again, like you don't have to do this just with software development. We've used this with academic, um, you know, building academic artifacts. So, you know, like talks, papers, um, abstracts, scheduling those out hitting deadlines, meeting deadlines, getting people's contributions together, and then publishing things in the form of an artifact. So, you know, just recently we had a workshop where we had seven contributors, I believe, six or seven contributors, and they all had to bring their work together in a certain, by a certain deadline. And the work was, you know, in different states of, of completeness, and we basically had to have everything either you know, pre-recorded or ready to go by a certain date. And so you know, that's, that's something that's very helpful. Your epic there would be the, you know, the sort of the, the presentation topic. The issues would be the different parts, the different people per, you know, contributing and maybe different issues related to what they need to do to complete their part of the deal. And then the sprint might be like, everyone is gonna work in this two week period intensely on this, you know, collaborating with each other, or, you know, getting in, into sync with each other so that we can get, have a nice polished presentation by the end and we present at a conference. So, I mean, this is, this is one way to do this. Um, you know, there are many ways to do this actually. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing if people can use this in very creative ways. Uh, so there's this introduction to Zen, Zen Hub Epics. So I may not have given it a lot, uh, it's due uh, justice in terms of the description, but this link, uh, this is a Zen Hub help file. This will tell you a little bit more about Zen Hub Epics and kind of gives you more detail about how to use them. Uh, and then working with Epics and GitHub. So this is where you're integrating Zen Hub and Zen Hub Epics with GitHub and GitHub issues. And this tells you how to do that. Okay, now I, that's all I'm gonna talk about in terms of specific tools. I did wanna go through a few readings and resources before I end today. And so there's some readings here and these are kind of like broad, more broadly applicable. 
They don't necessarily rely on any tool. But um, so this first one is what I've learned about open source project management milestones. This is by Tom McFarlane and it's on his blog. And this kind of goes through some of the open source project management milestones. And if we look at this article, we see that, um, you know, he has a series of posts on this. Uh, this is uh, about nine years old, so it's a little dated, but I think it'll, it'll serve its, its needs, serve our needs pretty well for this. Um, so he's talking a little bit about uh, what he's learned about open source project management, uh, working with WordPress plugin boilerplate specifically. So this is something that is, um, you know, something that that isn't something we talked about, but it's his project and he's giving you some pointer notes. Uh, so a number of these lessons are relatively commonplace in any team oriented environment. But however, when you're working in the open source culture with an unofficial distributed team, so that would be people who aren't like paid or, you know, in a or you know formally organized group. Um, there are nuances to the work that aren't always easy to manage, and as they are when it comes to running projects in a face-to-face -face environment. And I would add, it's not just face-to-face; -face, it's having everyone in the same roadmap and being intimately familiar with that roadmap. A lot of times, you have teams that come up with the roadmap collectively where they sit in meetings and they look at the roadmap every day and they know precisely where their place is. In an open source uh, contributor context, you often don't know exactly where you fit into the roadmap. You need to feel your way through it. And you don't wanna let that stand in the way of making a contribution because understanding that roadmap may take quite a while. Uh, in, in his last article, he talked a little bit about vision and mission. So this is about running projects for yourself as for a distributed team or for some organization and the kinds of things you need to keep in mind. And then this is this article itself is about milestones. So this kind of goes through milestones and um, this kind of goes on, you know, about how milestones tie into maintaining the vision and mission of a project. So, you know, that roadmap, the higher set of ideals, and then also this mission, which is usually some set of uh, goals that you want to achieve with it. So why do, why do you want to build this open source software? What is it helping people do? And, you know, you want to keep that in mind, but you also want to be able to do this by, you know, getting down into the weeds and the milestone, uh, you know, and different milestones and making things happen. So, um, you know, he tells you how to organize what's nice to have, what are must-haves, and perhaps even how the nice to haves will be must haves in a future iteration of the project. So here he's talking about you know these priorities. Like I said, you could prioritize your issues, your epics in ZenHub into you know must haves, nice to haves, and so forth. So you know there are things that you may need very directly to achieve your goals. There are also things that maybe you're good to have, but you don't. They aren't critical. And so that's another way to organize these things. And you don't really have tools for that, but it's something that you can build into the tools that I'm showing you here. Um, you can have, you know, your organization in say, um, in Notion, you can have a list of things that are maybe the critical components and then the less critical components, and then go to Zen Hub or GitHub and do with that integration, work out a timeline for these, and then look at the, you know, attach milestones and epics to them. And then you can work these out and you can address the must-haves. And when you get hung up on the must-haves, you might address the good-to-haves or the nice-to-haves and so forth. You can work like that. So he kind of goes through a definition of milestones. A milestone is an event that receives special attention. It is often put at the end stage to mark the completion of a work package or phase. Milestones can be put before the end of a phase so that corrective actions can be taken. If problems arise, and the deliverable can be completed on time. So this is just basically what a milestone is, but, but they're not immobile. You can move them around. As I warned, you don't wanna move them around indefinitely because you really wanna do, you know, the, the, one of the reasons they're there is to sort of serve as a mental uh, limit and say, this needs to be done at a certain time. There's a, there's a deadline here, there's an end point. And so this, is, this goes on about this, um, you know, and it doesn't tell you how to sort the issues. It just tells you that, you know, you can sort the issues and that the issues, you know, milestones are important 
it's just, you know, you have to figure this out on your own in your own context. Sometimes intuition is good, but maybe that's not enough. But, and then, like I said, there are really no direct management tools for this, but you can use other tools to sort of help you along the way. Uh, this is uh, some documentation on milestones. So this is from GitLab. So in GitLab, they use milestones quite a bit and they tell you kind of go over how this works. Um, so in GitLab, which is a competitor to GitHub, uh, milestones are a way to track issues and merge requests created to achieve a broader goal in a certain period of time. Uh, it allows you to organize issues and merge requests into a cohesive group with an optional start date and optional due date. So you can, again, play with those as you need to. You can actually use them as releases. So you can use attach them to certain versions of, of some software or certain versions of something you're working on. Um, you can use them as agile sprints. So you can track all the issues and merge requests related to a particular sprint. So you can organize them by what we did during the sprint. Um, and then you have group milestones, which are not just on projects, but you know any set of issues in, in some group. So this is kind of like how in ZenHub they use epics, but it's a little bit different. So yeah, they have APIs for this in GitLab. Uh, the role of milestones in agile project management. This is an article uh, from the ZenHub blog. So this goes on about like how milestones are used in agile project management. Uh, and it kind of goes through some of the deta technical details on this. Um, so some of the some examples of project milestones um, are as follows. You have core feature deliveries that you might want to deliver a certain feature by a certain date. You might want to mark the start or the due date of each project stage. You want to mark like huge events, landmark events like meetings or presentations, as I mentioned before. Uh, and sometimes those are mobile, but sometimes those move around. And then any other event that could impact the project's progress, including a new feature launch or simply completing completing some sort of plan. So this, you know, these come in handy. They're very flexible. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to this. And again, I, I, I think I've mentioned these. And um, so are they are milestones the best for agile project management? Maybe you're not really a big fan of agile. And that's fine. Um, you know, there are other ways you can mark progress. Certainly milestones are helpful, but they're not the only thing that you can use. Um, you know, you can work to completion on your own time, for example. As I said, the downside of that is you can't really integrate it well with other people's work. You, you know, and sometimes these things become indefinite. You just go on forever. You never finish anything. But some projects, and especially like if you're doing academic work or something like that, uh, or some sort of art, artistic work, you know, the, it's, it's a continual process. It's very hard to use milestones there. And so this is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, we have a Medium article on comparing sprints and milestones and then a set of completed milestones for the open source design project. This is open source design. They have a set of completed milestones. Let's look at this. This is from the design world. And this is a little bit different than like software development. So they've been uh, running this open source design project. At, they've been presenting at FOSDEM, which is a open source conference. Um, they've been doing these events regularly, year, annually. Um, they're able to, um, so they've gained 600 community members throughout this time period that they've been working on this intensely. Um, and so they, this is kind of a report on this. Uh, he, this person began to catalog a few key milestone, milestones from this uh, initiative starting in 2016. Um, so there will be events and occurrences I've missed, but here's a roundup of the last six years. So over the last six years, this project, this initiative, um, has, uh, there have been 540 topics posted on the open source design discourse forum. So they use a discourse forum and they have 540 topics. Uh, they have 186 job listings posted on their jobs board. They have 686 designers in their GitHub people organization. Uh, their open collective reaches over uh, 600 
thousand dollars. So I guess they're they're fundraising. Um, they've been able to reach um, their team from Nigeria reaches most members in the country in a country based team at 20 members and ties to Berlin, Germany. I guess that means that the, the team from Nigeria is able to, um, you know, they, they have a team of 20 members. They have ties to the German team. And, and so that, that suggests that they're able to organize really big groups and have ties with other groups around the world. So that's, these are all positive things that I'm, I'm reading through here. So you can see that there are a lot of positive things that they've done in the last five years. And these are all sort of milestones. And you can think of this as like, some of these were goals that started sort of, um, you know, they, they set out to do. Some of these happened and they were able to document them so that they can use them for future goals. So, you know, again, this is something you wanna do regularly. You wanna reevaluate, rescope what you're doing and then put them in this sort of framework, this planning framework. So there are other project management approaches uh, aside from agile and aside from like working with uh, issues and epics and things like that. And I'm just gonna go through a couple of these um, different, uh, they have two posts actually on this. The first one is my favorite open project management tools. And so this is a blog post, I believe, from opensource.com. And they talk about um, if you're managing large and complex projects, try replacing Microsoft Project with an open source object option. So they kind of go through these open source options. They were using Microsoft Planner and um, they kind of go through some project management tools here. So they talk about using things like Gantt charts. Um, and to use something like that, you might use Microsoft Project, but you might use some other platforms. So we didn't talk about Gantt charts, but Gantt charts are a form of like visualization. And there are different things that you can use uh, to manage large projects. And those have their uh, options. Uh, so you can use things like Trello. Um, you can use Redmine, which is actually another open source implementation of a Gantt chart. And this Gantt chart looks a lot like what we see with ZenHub. It gives you this like completion percentage. It allows you to track issues. So it's very similar to the Agile approach. Um, actually, it does focus on, it uses Agile methodologies. Uh, and then there's Project Open 5.1. This uses a similar approach. You can see that it's project management where you have all these different tasks and their percentage completion puts it on a, on a calendar for you. Um, and then they have a Gantt editor in here as well. Project Libre 1.9.3. And then this is a, you know, this is a similar thing where you have sort of a table on the side and then you can map this to issues and their uh, level of completion. Gantt Project 2.8.11, this just gives you another option for a Gantt chart. Task Juggler uh, Project with a QOR. So all these are different, uh, different you know, options for building Gantt charts and doing things like that. So there are a lot of different options, a lot of different open source options for this. They're very similar in the way they're set up. Some of them work on Agile principles, some of them are more exclu explicitly tied to Agile. Uh, and there are probably other ways to do this as well. I don't know, uh, you know, if people are interested in exploring this, the other ways of doing it, uh, you know, you may want to contact me. We can talk about it more. I've never really given it much thought. I've just kind of gone along with the agile flow, but um, there are other ways that I'm sure that you can implement these things. Um, but in any case, this is, this is one option. You know, these are open source options for things like Gantt charts, moving a little ways away from, from agile and some of the other um, you know, ways of managing projects. And then finally, there's this article on defining a minimal viable community. So this is less about tools and organizational uh, methodology. And it's uh, uh, Pam Maglaza. And uh, this is uh, from Comsor, I believe their blog. And so this talks about a minimum viable community. This is more about the collaboration aspect of it. So minimum viable community, what it is and how to build one. And so they talk about what a minimal viable community is. It's very similar to a minimal viable product, which is where a product 
you have a product with enough features to attract early adopter customers and validate a product idea. So a minimal, minimum viable community is the smallest group of people needed to come together for a shared purpose to create a community. And so you can see how that sort of vision intersects with some of the tools I've shown you. That you have these tools you can use as an individual, you can use it to build small collaborations, you can use it to interact with the actual you know, thing that you're building upon. So if it's a software platform, you're building upon that with your open source community. And you know, it allows you to organize into these minimal viable communities or the smallest group of people you can have to do something productive. Um, and so, you know, how many people are a small group? Be 10, five, 10, 30 members. Um, you, you know, if you want to do something, and you know, I would add these minimal viable communities are going to scale with these tools. So if you use a tool, you know, if you use a tool that allows you to scale more work to a smaller community or allows you to like synchronize better, uh, you can have smaller groups of people working on bigger problems. So if you didn't have these tools, you might need a community of 30 people. It may also be that smaller communities are better for achieving things because a larger community, you have more people, you know, kind of fighting over what's, how to do things. So, you know, having the smaller communities, you may be better, but you still need to have organizational principles and tools there to do it. So, you know, this this kind of argues for why why you want to start with a minimal viable community. But I think the value of this article is really talking about the size of the group that you want to, or the collaboration that you want, and then tying that into our tools and seeing you know how you might organize different tasks, different um, things in your community, and really you know a lot about sort of the substructure of the community, you know, how to build working groups, for example or how to build like, you know, um, groups that might come together for a little bit of time to achieve some type of task. So our, our talk that we had in the, um, in, this, in the Zen Hub timeline, this AI ethics framework, we had six people and they joined at different times and they contributed different things, but six was a good number. And it's actually large for something like that, for like a presentation, but it worked out because we synchronized sort of our goals with the size of the group, with the tools, and we were able to make it happen. So thank you for watching and uh, check out some of our other videos in, in the YouTube playlist. Thank you.